Hôm nay, Học viện Chính trị Hành chính quốc gia Hồ Chí Minh vô cùng phấn khởi được chào đón đoàn phái đoàn Liên minh châu Âu đến thăm và làm việc tại Việt Nam trong đó dành thời gian đến thăm và làm việc tại Học viện Chính trị Hành chính quốc gia Hồ Chí Minh và có cái bài phát biểu quan trọng. Chúng tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu đoàn đại biểu Liên minh châu Âu do Ngài Karendi Gosk cao ủy thương mại châu Âu xin chúng ta xin nhiệt liệt chào mừng tham gia đoàn phái đoàn liên minh châu Âu có bà Marius Hanonen thành viên của ủy ban nội các của liên minh châu Âu ông John Glancy phát ngôn viên của cao ủy ông Zhao Angina Machado, Phó Tổng Giám đốc Tổng cục Thương mại Ông Mauro Becchino Sione, Giám đốc Tổng cục Thương mại Bà Helena Con, à, coi chuyên gia cao cấp về các hội nghị của các quan chức kinh tế châu Âu Bà Marisa à, Cano Radis điều phối viên chính sách công về phái đoàn liên minh châu Âu tại Việt Nam chúng tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu ngài Fran Resen đại sứ liên minh châu Âu tại Việt Nam ông Jim Jacques Bollet tham tán công sứ trưởng phòng thương mại và kinh tế về phía học viện chúng tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu giáo sư tiến sĩ Nguyễn Đăng Thành phó giám đốc học viện chính trị hành chính quốc gia Hồ Chí Minh kiêm giám đốc học viện hành chính. Chúng tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu phó giáo sư tiến sĩ Nguyễn Tất Giác, phó giám đốc học viện. Tham gia vào buổi diễn đàn khoa học này còn có đông đảo các thủ trưởng, các đơn vị và các cán bộ nghiên cứu, các giảng viên và một số các nghiên cứu sinh cao học chuyên về lĩnh vực kinh tế cùng tham gia. Xin trân trọng uh, cho chúng ta một tràng vỗ tay. À, sau đây chúng tôi xin trân trọng kính mời à, đoàn chủ tịch dưới sự điều hành của giáo sư tiến sĩ nguyễn tân thành và giáo sư tiến sĩ phó giáo sư tiến sĩ nguyễn tất giác điều khiển tiền cái buổi tòa đàm này xin trân trọng kính mời thưa ngài đại sứ liên minh châu âu và các quan chức cao cấp của liên minh châu âu thưa toàn thể các nhà khoa học các vị đại biểu đến dự cuộc tòa đàm về liên minh kinh tế giữa Liên minh châu Âu và Việt Nam. Sau đây tôi xin trân trọng giới thiệu với tất cả các các vị đại biểu, các nhà khoa học, anh chị em học viên, cao học và nghiên cứu sinh của học viện, ngài các đại đầu sẽ trình bày cái bài phát biểu mà rất quan trọng, rất có ý nghĩa đối với toàn thể chúng ta. Xin chân thành cảm ơn. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. More open economies and more open societies are the reality of today's world. Faster and radically innovative communications technologies, cheaper and more efficient transportation mechanisms, more integrated and complex business practices. All of these uh, are working to make our age the most connected and the most integrated of all time. Those who will prosper in the coming decades will be those who embrace openness, taking advantage of its opportunities and avoiding its pitfalls. The recent history of Vietnam, your country, is an example of all that can be achieved by opening up. Through the policy of Doi Moi, Vietnam has moved from rigidity and control to openness and flexibility, allowing room first for domestic private enterprise, then for foreign investors, and gradually for a greater role of market forces in the economy. The result of Dormoy has indeed been a renovation. 
Openness has led to growth at an average rate of 6.5% between 2007 and 2011. This has meant huge declines in poverty and the rise of Vietnam at the ranks of global economies. Today, yours is a middle income country with, for the first time, a significant trade surplus. It attracts more and more foreign direct investments, the second highest after Singapore in the ASEAN region relative to GDP. And this investment is spurring further growth. More than half of exports are carried out by foreign investment companies. To give a more specific example, the connections of this school to international partners, including to important counterparts in Europe, is a very complete demonstration of the positive effects of openness. But uh, as we have all learned over the last five years, the future can never be taken for granted. Turbulence can be just around the corner. So after 27 years of toy boy, now is not the time to rest on laurels, but rather the time to turn at once again. For Vietnam's particular success to continue, more reform will be needed. And close the ties with the European Union can help Vietnam move forward on that path. The foundation of our relations is the partnership and cooperation agreement that we signed last year lays down the foundation for deep cooperation on development, economic relations and political dialogue, including okay. our strengthened discussion on human rights, an issue that is very important for the European Union. What we have been working on since uh, July last year is the next step, the negotiation of a comprehensive 21st century free trade agreement. If we are successful, this agreement will help move Vietnam forward on the path of openness in a broad range of ways. It will, uh, first of all, require us both to eliminate tariffs on substantially all of our trade, providing our companies with new market access, but also increasing competition at home, making our economies stronger and more resilient. But, uh, more importantly for Vietnam's reform efforts, this agreement will go far beyond tariffs. It will cover foreign direct investment disciplines on state-owned enterprises, public procurement, trade and raw materials, sustainable development, and perhaps most importantly, the regulatory framework which will allow Vietnam to build on the reforms it made when it joined the WTO on issues like transparency and public consultation, all of which will make the system more effective and in tune with real economic needs. There is a great potential here, but of course with all reforms come challenges of implementation, challenges that can be more acute in the context of a developing economy, even one that has been as successful as Vietnam. That is why the EU is prepared to provide a program of aid for trade parallel to the agreement to help with the process of removing difficult bottlenecks and improving infrastructure in the broad sense, from education to standards and infrastructure like roads and bridges. Total European development assistance to Vietnam now stretches to over 750 million euro per year. A considerable portion of future funding will be dedicated to helping implementation of any deal we reach. Beyond the rules aspect of the agreement is the more fundamental point. Closer economic relations with the European Union are themselves a driver of development and economic openness. I know that many of you will be asking whether Europe can still be such a strong partner, given all that you read in the press about our economy. The truth is that the uh, euro, a young currency just over 10, year, 10 years old, and a radical experiment in economic integration, has been facing the toughest crisis of its existence. 
we have uh, learned that the original structures we created to manage this new union were not up to the task of dealing with the sort of problems we faced after the 2008 global financial crisis. But uh, allow me to reassure you, we have made decisive progress towards fixing those structural problems. In the face of a clear need to change, Europe has responded with action. Our member states are reforming their economies and public finances, and the Union is reinforcing the structures of cooperation needed to make the European economy work. And these reforms are delivering results. Markets are calm. In the countries that have had the toughest ride up to now, there are positive signs. Current account balances are improving, deficits are down, exports are up. Ireland looks likely to be the first country to leave a bailout program later this year. Now we have, uh, of course, a way still to go. Having restored stability, we now have to restore growth. But we are on our way to delivering that too, not least because of the structural reforms that have been made and the fact that stability itself boosts confidence. But Vietnam will not need to wait for Europe's full recovery to benefit from closer economic ties with us. Because crisis of no crisis, the European Union is still the world's largest economy, with a GDP of 15 trillion euro and 500 million affluent consumers. We are the largest foreign investor and the largest host of foreign direct investments. We are the world's largest exporter and its largest importer, as well as the largest importer of products from developing countries specifically. Even in 2012, a year when the European economy contracted slightly, imports from our trading partners actually grew. And uh, those imports have a unique characteristic. One of the impacts uh, of the scale of the European single market is that we import products at every stage of the value chain. from primary goods like basic foodstuffs to the highest technology equipment and the most advanced services. That means having more access to our market will not only help Vietnam's farmers or your highly competitive textiles, clothing and footwear industries, but also the most advanced parts of the consumer goods sector and all the high-tech industries and services providers of the future. Already our trade relations come to 18 billion euro a year. But this is just a fraction of the EU's total trade, meaning that we are now only scratching the surface of this relationship. What we need is a partnership for the long term. And that is what this agreement can provide, a stable framework for our relations to grow. It is true that uh, many Vietnamese companies can already export to Europe at lower tariffs under our preference system for developing countries. But this system is not enough to foster the partnership we want. <coughs> for one thing, more than half of Vietnam's exports are subject to tariffs. For another, change is built into the nature of the system. Preferences are only designed to give developing industries a head start. Once they become more competitive, they, the preferences apply, as has been the case in the industry. Finally, the preference system only goes one way. It does not help Vietnam reform its economy or continue on the path of toy war. Now let me also say this. This agreement is not only about openness for Vietnam. It is also part of Europe's own right to use international trade and investment to boost growth at home. It is part of our recovery strategy. But it is not the only agreement that Europe is pursuing. Far from it, we are building a vast network of similar deals that should eventually cover two-thirds of all our trade. We are talking to Vietnam's ASEAN partners, to India, to Japan, to our partners in Latin America, 
and to the United States and Canada. We already have deals with many more countries, including South Korea, Mexico and Chile. Vietnam is also moving ahead with a wide range of new agreements through border ASEAN negotiations and through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This has two impacts for our own talks. The first is that the status quo is not an option. We need to move forward in order to avoid falling behind. The second is that we must keep an eye on the progress being made in Europe's negotiations with Vietnam's ASEAN partners. It is in both of our interests to foster regional integration and regional value chains. The best way to do this is to make sure that all of these bilateral EU-ASEAN agreements are as compatible and as coherent as uh, possible. So far, the only concluded agreement is with Singapore. And while Vietnam and Singapore are different economies, it is important that we see that text as a template for our own work. Mr. President, uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to say that the negotiations between Vietnam and the European Union have so far proceeded, proceeded very smoothly. But there is a long road ahead and before we reach a conclusion, some difficult decisions and significant changes will have to be made. The students of this school, as young people and as potential leaders of <coughs> Vietnam, have the keenest interest in the outcome of these negotiations. The same is true of your uh, counterparts in universities across Europe. It is uh, your generation who will feel the benefits of closer relations and a more open economy and society. I hope that you will watch closely what we negotiators are doing and make sure that we stay on the right path. The path to openness, to growth and to prosperity. Thank you very much for your attention. Trên cơ sở của một cái bài phát biểu với những nội dung chính yếu và quan trọng như vậy Xin mời các nhà khoa học rồi các vị đại biểu tham dự của tọa đàm Có thể nêu những vấn đề Rồi cũng có thể có những bình luận Và chúng tôi chờ đợi nghe các cái ý kiến bình luận cũng như là những cái vấn đề câu hỏi các vị đặt ra. Thưa các em, chúng tôi là thành viên của đoàn. Xét theo thiết kế và hiệp định thương mại tự do Việt Nam EU, tôi xin có mấy kiến về cái này. Tôi biết như sau. Thứ nhất là tôi biết các nhà đàm phán của EU thì cũng là một trong những trường phái đàm phán hết sức sòng phẳng và minh bạch. Tuy nhiên, theo như tôi được biết, thì các nhà đàm phán với EU thì luôn luôn rất kiên quyết trong việc giữ lại những vấn đề liên quan đến hai dòng thuế là hàng nông sản và sản phẩm nông nghiệp và trong đó đặc biệt là thủy sản. Vậy thì trong khuôn khổ đàm phán với Việt Nam về hiệp định TPA này I must say that there is quite a lot of interest for the negotiations in your country. Um, first of all, on seafood, uh, this, uh, this part of fisheries, so I'm not a particular uh, expert on that, but as far as I know, it has to see with the um, uh, degree of medicines in that seafood. No? Um, and we have very uh, tight SPS rules, so rules on health and safety. And one of the features of the upcoming negotiation, upcoming I've already started, is precisely that we would also work on regulatory approximation. And regulatory approximation, of course, only works if it also uh, filters down to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the real economic world, and in, in this case, the production of seafood. Uh, so there is uh, one very good solution to the problem in seafood, that's uh, uh, to have uh, much less uh, 
um, medicines uh, and our residues of, of medicines and the seafood that you were want to export uh, uh, to Europe. And this, of course, has to see something with Western <coughs> methods. One of the reasons that you uh, need to uh, uh, have these medicines is, uh, uh, for example, uh, an overpopulation of shrimps, you know, and then uh, uh, to avoid that to get uh, illnesses uh, in that uh, population, you need uh, medicines. And so you have to do something about the way that you are producing. It's not that we are protecting our markets against you, but what you cannot ask us is that we will change our health and safety provisions and have a more uh, laxist approach to those. Um, few Vietnamese products, I wouldn't say that because uh, uh, you uh, are exporting quite a lot to, uh, uh, to Europe, uh, and by the way, you have a, a huge. Uh, um, trade service with Europe, and you uh, export much more to Europe than we uh, export to you. My recollection is good, it's, uh, we export for about 13 and we uh, export for about 5, so there's a, a gap of 8, and so uh, we are certainly not protectionist towards uh, your products. What is true is that um, as a result of uh, the lack of a free trade agreement, you have more than half of your products, 58% uh, to be precise, that uh, um, have to pay uh, duties when you uh, want to be on the European market. So that would considerably go down to uh, at least, I would say, 90%, even more, if you were to have a free trade agreement. And now, this is not the case, because GSP, a general system of preferences that, by the way, will continue for the country after 2014. Uh, you can have graduation, like for example, good way, that's something else, but the system as such will continue. That uh, GSP system covers only 67% of products. So, and it's also a, a, a product range that is, is, is much more focusing on LDCs, on least developed countries. So it means that uh, the number of, of uh, high-end products that you want to produce, that you want to export, will need an FDA to uh, get uh, free entrance into the European uh, market. And the last question about the market economy status. Uh, this is uh, ritualistic uh, because uh, it uh, wouldn't change that much for your economy. It would only have an impact uh, for the, uh, uh, the so-called uh, trade defense instruments, uh, for dumping, for example. Uh, but uh, I understand that you are not the only country that uh, attaches a lot of symbolical uh, value to this uh, uh, status of, of, uh, of um, a market economy. Now, what you should also understand is that this standard of market economy can only keep its value or for also for you, provided that we are not lowering the criteria. And uh, up to now, uh, you uh, uh, respond uh, uh, to uh, one out of five criteria. The second one, you made quite a lot of progress, and also on the other ones, there is progress, uh, but not uh, to an extent that uh, it could uh, um, lead to a recognition as a market economy status. Now, market economy status and the free trade agreement that is presently under negotiations are two different things. They are two different parts. Um, you could imagine to have market economy status without a free trade agreement, but you could as well imagine to have a free trade agreement and not market economy status. <coughs> market economy status is a technical appraisal of what is happening in your market. Is your market really behaving as a market economy? And you have been making quite a lot of progress with the doi moi, uh, but you need to, deal, to do a, an important number of additional steps, for example, on SOEs, on state-owned enterprises. 
which is a, a, a major stumbling block uh, also for the free trade agreement, but also for yourself, huh? because it's uh, uh, the, uh, the financing of the SOEs that has led to such a high number of non-performing loans in your banks. And so I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it would be beneficial for both, but also for you, to do something about state-owned uh, uh, enterprises. So that's uh, where we are. So the idea that some might put forward that as a result of uh, a free trade agreement you would automatically obtain a market economy status is not true. In your accession treaty to the WTO, 2018 is foreseen for market economy status as kind of an automaticity, but it would be much better if you had it before, because that would demonstrate that you have additionally worked on openness of your economy. Trong quá trình hội đàm đàm phán giữa Việt Nam với Liên minh Châu Âu về cái quan hệ kinh tế thương mại, thì các ngài thấy cái khung pháp lý Việt Nam có những gì thuận lợi và có những cái gì mà cần phải hoàn thiện để đáp ứng tốt cho cái giải quyết cái quan hệ này. Đây là câu hỏi. You are already exporting quite a lot of uh, products uh, into the European Union, um, but uh, a lot of additional work needs to be done. I mentioned the, uh, the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises. I could mention uh, public uh, procurement, um, intellectual property, the, the protection of intellectual property, because it's a very important uh, cornerstone uh, for attracting foreign direct uh, in investment. An investor wants to have an, uh, um, a stable um, economic, uh, financial and uh, legal framework. That's what they want to have. Um, <coughs> in one word, uh, sir, you have to open further. What you are presently exporting is the result of the openness till now. If you want to export more, it will not necessarily be more of the same. It would rather be moving at the value chain because you will, have, you will see more and more in your own neighborhood that the number of countries become competitors on what up to now are about your most important export products. You will see that competition with Cambodia, with uh, Laos, uh, with uh, uh, Myanmar in, in a number of years, uh, Bangladesh and so on. Uh, so uh, you, you have to move up the value chain if you want to continue to grow. And there, I believe, uh, the uh, uh, coming about of, of a free trade agreement will be of the utmost importance, provided it is not a hollow agreement. Because uh, a lot of uh, agreements are concluded that in, in the end uh, uh, are very hollow and, and loose. That's what we do not want to do. What we want to do is establish together with you a legal framework and a contractual framework so that our uh, relations can steadily grow. That's what we want to do. And that's not only by uh, making away with tariffs, it's about a lot of other disciplines. Trong bài phát biểu thì ông De Bush có đề cập đến là cái sự chia sẻ cái giá trị của khu vực và cái sự hội nhập giữa khu vực, đặc biệt là châu Âu và Đông Nam Á, ASEAN là một trong những cái mục tiêu chung hướng tới cái quá trình đàm phán và hướng tới cái sự chia sẻ giữa châu Âu và Singapore. Sir, the time frame uh, depends uh, very much on the parties concerned. Um, I remember very well that your Prime Minister uh, told us in 2010 that uh, your country was very much interested in negotiating a free trade agreement with us. But for good reasons, eh, by the way, then after it took about two years before we actually could start with the negotiations. Uh, if we want to uh, uh, conclude them successfully in short notice, we will have to make that political effort. Uh, it's not going to come from itself. So uh, it's a matter of political effort, I think, but we are ready and we stand ready.
to uh, have these negotiations um, in a very sustained way and trying to uh, get to results uh, rather sooner than later. Uh, well, what you need to do, I already mentioned a couple of times, uh, that there are uh, a number of uh, areas where really something still should uh, happen, but I'm sure that together we can uh, create the conditions for doing so. For the, it comes down to about 750 million euros a year, which is a, a vast amount of money. And, uh, larger part of that money will be used uh, to uh, uh, finance your adaptation to the new three trade agreements. For example, to do work on, on uh, SPS, on, on uh, health and safety uh, uh, rules. Also uh, work with you on trade facilitation. So there are no physical hindrances anymore to export goods to the uh, European Union work together on SPS so that your products are, are uh, automatically accepted on the European market. So you are right to put this question, but be assured that there is a major part of money, major uh, amount of money that has been liberated to uh, assist you in the transition towards an agreement with uh, uh, Europe. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, To have a, a, a clear view on, on, on this and to uh, give an uh, appropriate answer, I first have to say that uh, you should know that for the European Union, the euro is not just an uh, economic uh, monetary feature, it is uh, very much a uh, political deed. And uh, we have been saying all the crisis through that we would do whatever needed to uh, save the euro. In the beginning, nobody seemed to uh, listen to us or to believe us. And in fact, the markets, the markets calmed down, and they had to come to the conclusion that in any case, what was not going to happen is that uh, the uh, euro uh, disappeared or eclipsed in, in, in several uh, subgroups of the countries. And I believe that is, uh, that is going to continue like that. Uh, it will uh, also in the future be the case that you have countries who do it uh, um, relatively well on their own. You will have countries that are fully integrated in the uh, monetary union. But I believe that over time, the number of countries that are not member of the European uh, monetary union will drastically diminish and may be very close to zero. Uh, because there's a logic behind, you know, if you want to safeguard that, uh, that currency, you have to take a number of measures on economic governance, on budgetary governance, uh, which means that uh, the powers of the, of the European Union and of the Commission towards member states become more and more intricate. Uh, so that, that there comes a moment of choice. The only thing I can say is that I'm intimately convinced that the choice will be that everybody stays in the uh, monetary union and you will see in a very short period of time that there will be new applicants to become a member of the European Monetary Union. Uh, xin uh, chân thành cảm ơn uh, Ngài Cao Ủy. Uh, chúng tôi uh, vì uh, cái lý do và kế hoạch về mặt thời gian nữa nên chúng ta uh, sẽ xin uh, tạm dừng ở đây thay mặt uh, lãnh đạo công viện và cùng toàn thể cán bộ khoa học cũng như học viên bảo vệ chúng tôi uh, xin chân thành cảm ơn uh, chuyến thăm làm việc và bài phát biểu cũng như là những cái chia sẻ có thể nói uh, rất là quý báu của ngài cao đình 
thay mặt lãnh đạo viện anh em trong học viện chúng tôi uh, xin uh, chân thành chúc công việc của uh, ngài cao ủy và các thành viên trong đoàn trong chuyến thăm và làm việc tại việt nam này có được uh, hiệu quả tốt đẹp chúc cho uh, eu vượt qua được khúc canh khúc quanh này một cách ngoạn mục nhất chúng tôi uh, sẽ có trách nhiệm từ góc độ của mình làm cho cái liên minh quan hệ kinh tế giữa Việt Nam và EU cũng như quan hệ toàn diện khác có cái sự phát triển có hiệu quả ở giai đoạn hiện nay cũng như ở phía sau chúng tôi xin uh, chân thành cảm ơn và xin kết thúc hội nghị đây.